Welcome to Lesson 3C, Submerged Curved Plate. In this lesson, we'll discuss how to calculate the magnitude and direction of the net resultant force on a submerged curved plate of any shape. Then we'll look at the line of action of this resultant force. We'll restrict our analysis to a cylindrical plate, for which I'll do an example problem. In previous lessons, we looked at a vertical flat plate and an inclined flat plate. Now let's look at some arbitrary curved plate. We will restrict our discussion to 2D plates, where it's two-dimensional into the page, but the actual shape of the plate can be any shape. For the flat plates, we calculated the resultant force, which was always normal to the plate. For this case, we can also calculate a resultant force, in particular its magnitude and direction, but it will be more difficult to find the location where this force acts. That sounds really complicated. It makes me nervous. Don't get too nervous, Mr. Nerdly. I'll show you a trick here that will make things a lot easier. Okay, thanks. Well, here's a nice little trick. If this is our surface, our curved plate, let's project the areas of this plate horizontally and vertically. If we know the distance from the surface of the water to the plate, we can easily calculate this force, the net pressure force acting on this projected area. Namely, in terms of gauge pressure, the pressure on this face is just rho gs, and force Fy is that pressure times the projected horizontal area, which is this area here. For the vertical projected area, we do the same analysis we did in a previous lesson, and we know how to calculate this net resultant force FH. Namely, if this is the centroid, the force acts at the center of pressure. The horizontal force is rho g times yp times this projected vertical area, this area, where yp is the distance from the surface to the center of pressure, as previously. We also need to consider the weight of the water. Consider this shaded volume of water here. It turns out that the net pressure force on the curved surface is the same as or equal to the net pressure force on its projected flat surfaces. The trick then is to just calculate the forces on these projected areas, add them up vectorially, and that will be the same force acting on the actual curved surface. But we also have to consider the volume of this enclosed chunk of water here. Let's redraw this. Consider this chunk of water as a control volume. We have some horizontal pressure force, a vertical pressure force, but we also have to consider the net weight W of this water. Since W acts vertically, horizontal force FH is the same as that on the projected vertical area. In the notation in the book, we also call this FX, but the coordinate system is kind of confusing because X is horizontal and Y is down. So FH equal FX. That's the horizontal component. What about the vertical component? The net vertical component of the force acting on this curved surface in the downward direction is Fy, but we must add the weight of this water since we're calculating these forces on these projected areas rather than on the surface itself. So Fv is Fy plus W. So that's the vertical component of force. This is for the case with the surface below the projected horizontal area, which is the way we've drawn it here. Here's the surface and here's the projected horizontal area. In other words, for the case where we're considering the water on top of this surface. What if instead we have a submerged surface, but we're interested in the resultant force acting on the bottom of the surface? Again, we consider this chunk of water as a control volume. The weight is down, but this time Fy is up, and Fh is to the right in this case. In this case, Fh is still equal to Fx to the right, but the magnitude of the vertical force is now Fy minus W since they're acting in opposite directions, and this is upward. In our previous case, the vertical force was downward, and the horizontal force was to the left. So you have to be careful of where your surface is compared to the water namely above or below the water. So this is for the case with the surface above the projected horizontal area. For either case, once we've defined the magnitudes and directions of the horizontal and vertical forces, we use vector summation to find the resultant force. Namely, the resultant force is the square root of the sum of FH squared plus FV squared. This is just the magnitude of this resultant force. But where does this force act? We also need to calculate the line of action of this resultant force. Namely, once we've calculated FH, FV, and the magnitude of the resultant force, we may want to know where it acts. We would call this the line of action. I drew it at some arbitrary location, but it may act here or here, each of these indicating a different line of action. For an arbitrary shape, you're going to have to integrate. For the simple case of a cylindrical shape, though, in other words, circular arcs, 
for example, a quarter circle or a semicircle, where I've marked the center of the circle. It turns out that the line of action always points towards the center. So now we know exactly where FR acts. This is true for any section of a circular arc or a cylindrical body. It also works if the water is above the surface or below the surface. In this course, we're going to consider only cylindrical surfaces. So for any cylindrical surface or portion of a cylinder, we can calculate the horizontal and vertical forces from which we calculate the resultant force and the angle of that resultant force, and then move it such that it aligns with the line of action which passes through the center of the cylinder. This should be more clear when we do an example problem. This is example 3.9 of our textbook, a gravity-controlled cylindrical gate. This is a practical problem where you have a gate composed of a cylinder of some weight holding back water of some depth, and it's designed to release the water when the water level rises above a certain value, here 5 meters. You can see there's a hinge here, and if this resultant force is large enough, it will lift this cylinder off the ground a little bit, allowing the water to flow through. We want to determine the net force acting on its cylinder under these conditions when the gate opens, and then the weight of the cylinder per meter length of the cylinder, in other words, per unit length into the page in this diagram. Well, this is an example of our second kind of case where the water is below the curved surface. So we draw our projected areas and consider this little chunk of water as our control volume. We sketch that here by itself. We have the weight of the water, the horizontal force, and the vertical force. From these we can calculate the resultant force acting on the water. The resultant force acting on the cylinder is equal and opposite to that because of Newton's third law. This resultant force has to pass through the center of the cylinder, even though we only have one-fourth of the cylinder exposed to the water. Note that as previously we're using gauge pressures, so all around the cylinder the pressure is atmospheric except for this portion where it's submerged and exposed to the water. In this case, the net pressure force is up and the weight is down, so we subtract these two to get the vertical force. You can read this in more detail in the textbook. We're neglecting friction at the hinge, and we'll use 1,000 kilogram per meter cube for the density of the water. As mentioned here, we consider this chunk of water as a control volume. Think of this imaginary vertical surface as a flat plate aligned vertically and submerged in water. From a previous lesson, we know how to calculate the horizontal force on this projected area. We call that Fx here. So the horizontal force, Fh or Fx, is the average pressure times the area, rho ghc, the depth of the centroid, times the area. The centroid is S plus halfway through that projected surface, R over 2 in this case. So that's the depth at which the average pressure acts. So our horizontal force is just rho g quantity s plus r over 2a. We plug in all the values with the unit conversion and get our horizontal force in kilonewtons. What about the vertical force? Our projected area is at the full depth of this dam, which is 5 meters. And since it's horizontal, the pressure is constant all along that projected area. So the vertical force acting up is just rho g h bottom. This is the depth from the surface of the water all the way to the bottom times area. That bottom is 5 meters. We plug in some numbers here. We get 39.2 kilonewtons. We also need to calculate the weight. So what is the weight of this little chunk of water? Well, it's kind of hard to calculate the area of this section, but if you complete a square here, this is a square of dimensions r. We know the area of this square. It's just r squared. And we know the area of this quarter of a circle, namely pi r squared divided by 4. So the total area is the area of the square minus the area of the quarter circle, r squared minus pi r squared over 4. One meter here is unit length into page, and the weight of the water is mg, which is rho g volume, so we have rho g times this area times the length into the page. This gives us 1.3 kilonewtons. And remember, we're subtracting w here since fy is up and w is down. So fv is 37.9 kilonewtons upward. The horizontal force, meanwhile, acts to the right. To get the net resultant force magnitude, we do a vector summation of these two using this equation. We get 52.3 kilonewtons. The angle can also easily be determined tangent of our angle theta is the vertical force divided by the horizontal force. It turns out to be 46.4 degrees. And as I mentioned, for cylindrical surfaces, this resultant force acts through the center of the circular arc. So this is the answer to part A. 
For part B, we need to calculate the weight of the cylinder such that the gate will open when the water is 5 meters high. If you think about it, the cylinder has some weight, and the only other force acting on it is this resultant force we just calculated, again noting that it passes through the center of the cylinder. When will this cylinder start to tilt up? Well, under the conditions, you can easily see that if we take the net moment about hinge A, when the moment due to the resultant force, FR times this distance, is equal to the opposite moment due to the weight, W of the cylinder, times this distance, which is just R, the net moment will be zero. I spell this out here so you can read the details later. So the moment equals zero at the desired conditions when this cylinder will start to move up and let the water gush out, when the moment from this force, FR times R sine theta, is equal to the weight times this distance R, W cylinder times R. We solve for W cylinder. The R's actually cancel, so W cylinder is FR times sine theta. We plug in the numbers here to get the weight of the cylinder. This is the answer to part B. Finally, we can calculate the mass required of this cylinder from which we can get its density, since the volume of the cylinder will be pi r squared times 1 meter into the page. All these answers are per unit length into the page, or per meter into the page. Going back to our original diagram, the weight we calculated is the one that causes this cylinder to turn up when the water depth is 5 meters. Once the water starts coming out, the weight will be larger than the torque or moment on this hinge, and it'll close itself off. If we had a heavier weight, we would be able to have a higher water head here before it would start coming out. If this were not a cylindrical shape, we could calculate the magnitude and direction of the resultant force, but you would have to do some integration to calculate the line of action. Fortunately for a cylinder, or any portion of a cylinder, the line of action always passes through the center, so this makes our life easier. That really was a nice trick, Professor. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.